This week's episode is sponsored by White's Beaconsfield. White's Beaconsfield is the number one company in the UK to brighten up your smile at a very affordable price. Get your perfect smile today using code AGJAMESENGLISH at checkout for a 15% discount on all products. from White's Beckinsfield. I'm on day five out of seven and my teeth are looking white. So it doesn't contain peroxide, so it's very, very safe for you to use on your teeth. It doesn't cause any sensitivity and I've literally got the most sensitive teeth. The most affordable product, works like a dream. Look how white, with no filter, no sensitivity, and it is just one of the best that I've ever used. Like, that's three days, it's crazy. You can now follow me on all my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest will be. And don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notifications button so you're notified for when my next podcast goes live. I used the knife, stuck up the officer, made him undo the uncuffs, and then I took all three of them out of the car and took the car and drove it off and escaped, made good my escape. Everything got close and personal and fast and it just all happened like quick 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 because once he said that then the first officer was like close to me do you get me and then it just happened from there like all in like half a second i didn't go think as far as that i want to mm -hmm. kill i just thinking as far as i want to escape that's the truth because if i was thinking as far as to kill people then i'd not be nasty i'll be shooting people in their head not in their leg. FBI team arrested us, found 20 key of weed in the house, I found a Mac 11 in my waist, a Glock in the kitchen, and like 20, like a key of coke. So it was a drug factory, the house. Prison ain't no nice place, and no one ain't tougher than them bars. And when it comes down to it, it's a cold, sterile, unhealthy place, you understand? with unhealthy characters everywhere and you have to keep yourself sane in all of that for 20 years. Then we're on. Today's guest, we've got London's Leroy Smith. How are you, brother? Yes, my brother. Pleased to meet it's you. It's good to meet you. Yeah, man, it's nice. Still. You've led a very interesting life. Yeah. Um, you've done 25 years in prison for shooting two coppers. 20 out of 25. Yeah, but the yeah. interesting thing is when you actually came out, you actually met one of the guys at James, yeah. Seymour. Yeah. He wanted to meet you. Yeah. Fascinating story that had to be yeah. doing what you've done and then to come out and change your life. First of all, congratulations for making the changes. Thank you. How are you? It's amazing and every day is just like a blessing and it's a long journey what's got to this stage but basically I came out of prison to a good person who supported me morally and financially and then it came to the stage where she started to ask me now what am I what am I going to do with my actual self like in society full stop and what could I do what would be the best to give back to society and benefit everybody and my own self at the same time to become someone because I'm just at the moment coming from prison an ex-offender and a, a naughty one you get me yeah so then we came up with a conclusion about writing a book we out of the box out of the box and where can people get this book it's on Amazon it's on my website it's in some WH Smith yeah. it's very easy as soon as you put it in Google we will leave all the links in the description for people it's watching just now get. 
So basically that book started the chain of events, what's led me to today where I am. And it's just amazing because I didn't hold back no punches. I told the truth. There's not one lie inside that book. And, and I told it with the intentions of people to be able to read it and gain knowledge from it for their own self in their own life. So they don't maybe have to feel the pain what I felt when I had to go through what I went through, even though I did it myself, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Yeah. So yeah. basically that was what it was. Mm -hmm. And then that's the book what James read and then emailed the, uh, per the person what laid the book out. Uh, that's another James. Mm -hmm. and then James he, is a popular yeah. name, mate. <laughs> yeah. so all the kings yeah. are called James. Yeah. And then it came back to me and then the same lady what I was telling you about, she uh, said she would come with me. And then we went there and we met at a train station and I just said sorry to him to his face and just shook his hand and he was just like down to earth and we had a cup of coffee and just talked about how all of that happened mm -hmm. and yeah. Yeah, that's mad and it takes it's a bigger crazy. man to forgive and forget. I believe in life you've got to forgive to release the pain. But to do that, me personally it's I'm not I talk lie. about forgiving and shit, yeah. but to do that is I'm not gonna it lie. takes a proper scared. man. Yeah. yeah, I was scared. I was mm -hmm. scared. When I was going, I was scared. I'm not yeah, you would have scared. been. Yeah. I always go back to the start with my guest brother. Mm. Kind of where you grew up and how it all began. Okay, so basically I grew up in South London. Uh, my mum got murdered when I was two and then I grew up with my gran until I was around 13, 14. Then I just started doing petty crime and just going on the roads and then started going in prison little four months then some six months and i got a free year and then i was around a circle of kids who were doing some naughty armed robberies but by then i was doing my free so then when i came out i just stepped up my game as well and then because at them times burglaries and that you could find guns easy and that so we ended up with with, with guns and started doing armed robberies and just basically having my own weight on the back of, of a gun. How basically. old were you? From the age of, say like 19 to 25, that's when it was thick. Yeah. Yeah. What about your teenage years and stuff? Teenage, I was kind of, when, to begin, I was a timid person to begin with. I was, yeah. You bullied? I, yeah, a little bit. When I was young, yeah, I got robbed once and I, and, and I never forgot it, do you understand? And uh, I witnessed our people, when you're weak, how they, they always get the bad end of everything. Does that make sense? Yeah. So you learn that fast. And then when you start bringing guns into the equation, then you, it's not a physical thing anymore. It's a psychological thing. So then you can have the drop on someone who was physical, but not got the psychological package, package to mm -hmm. be able to enforce that. So when you're going to pull that on someone, the reaction you get is going to give you a shock and you're going to think, wow, this is extreme power, you understand? And then it just spirals into something and you just turn into this person because you're just into a yes world now because no one don't say no to you again yeah. every time. And it's all underworld people, so they all got every reason to just take it, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. With your mum as well, did that feel a lot of anger and violence with you as well? And you started to realise yeah, what did, happened yeah. to her? When I realised what happened, it was just like, I was like, wow, my mum's dead. But I didn't really understand. But then when the council, one man came to work for the council a few years later, and then he died by heart attack or something in the stairwell. And it just resonated with me that he was dead. And everyone said, oh, he's dead. And then they put the blanket over his head. Do you understand? And then that's when I've, and, and then I've, and I was really thinking, I was saying, wow, they put the blanket over his head, so he's definitely dead, you understand? Mm -hmm. And then when I got a bike, I used to always get my granddad to come and call, call him to carry it past the spot where the man died. And I used to always look back, look back at the spot, yeah? And I don't know why, because it was just a spot, but that's where the man died. And then years and years later, when I started dealing with crime and all of that, that death thing would just be in, the, in there somewhere. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. And then as life's going along, you, your journey, you start to realize that you ain't got so much empathy, like, you understand? Mm -hmm. For certain things, it's a bit, you're like more selfish and you just care about your own self. Yeah. 
and then that's the story basically so as kids but we're all pure we're all honest we are and going down that life if your mum's been murdered if you've seen a dead body then you were full of love at the start but then you realise okay love love can get you killed as well where you become then ruthless holding a gun or holding a knife becomes your comfort blanket and the ironic thing is you want to be loved and you think that it's love when people are being nice to you but it's scared they're scared of you mm -hmm. do you understand yeah now i understand that but at the time i didn't and i really thought that people did love me <laughs> you understand mm -hmm. yeah but it's scared they're scared of me yeah you understand but they're also yeah uh, like life of crime and that everyone's kind of scared and vulnerable you mm -hmm. tend to see there is a link that the majority of people in a life of crime have been bullied or abused mm -hmm. it becomes um i believe that the loudest man or the angriest man is the weakest man they pretend to be fine, but they protect herself with obviously a knife or a gun because they've through so much trauma and pain and hurt that they don't want to feel that shit anymore. So I'll pull out a shooter mm. and nobody's going to harm the me anymore. So I'll draw fear. The is the attack. Yeah, of course. That's, yeah. That's what they say. So what was your first sentence then, Leroy? So I got four months DC. For what? Uh, for some stupid street robbery or something along them lines. And. Uh, was in uh, Send in Woking with this horrible set of people and a night man called Chips and he used to call you Chips. yeah and make you make your bed pack up if one person makes noise he wakes up the whole dormitory and then makes you unruffle up your whole kit yeah because remember everything's like an army so you have to make square bed packs square you understand and your mm -hmm. boots shine everything and they ruffle up the whole thing and make you do it all again and then that's your whole night messed up and then you have to wake up at six. So it's going to ruin you, you understand? He's yeah, like, army regiment. Yeah, he's like a torturer. I'm not yeah. joking. If he's still alive, you're a horrible man. <laughs> yeah, I'm really serious. You really shouldn't be like that to people. Yeah. The man used to relish grabbing people and pulling them through the yeah. bar and everything there. And I'm thinking, that's how you rehabilitate people. It wasn't a nice experience, but it didn't change me. And then the next one was four months again. But by then I'd learned from the first thing. So when I came through reception and they do all the shouting and screaming, I was already prepared for it and it didn't affect me because they and they knew that I had sent them my file. So they didn't even want to try. But then I see other kids come and they're in tears because of what's happening. And then when we go to the gym, I do things like go in the middle of the bench press. Now you know like a big chip bench mm -hmm. yeah so yeah. so you got one on each head and i'll go in the middle because i know they're gonna have to take the weight you understand mm -hmm. and and that's it and they're, they're, the officers are gonna be onto them and i've seen it it weren't nice you've got big grown men on little boys saying yeah he went fucking crying when he was nicking the handbag was ya? hey you fucking mm -hmm. shit lift it up you understand and the boy you understand mm -hmm. so Did that make you go anti-authority then it made me realize that the system ain't got no love. You understand? So if you're looking for love in any of them corners, you might as well forget it, yeah? And it makes you and them be on the opposite side of a fence, isn't it? Because everything to do with the system is geared up for the system. That's imperialism and that's capitalism joined together. Mm -hmm. It's gonna be not in your favor if you're underprivileged or a person of color or from an, you know, from an uh, underprivileged background. So it's gonna be kind of against you anyway. And then if you mix crime into it, you're just gonna be a lost soul because you're not gonna want no dealings with them. So I had probation and when they came for me, rightly so, because I wasn't going to school, I ran away. Then I went to Latchman House for a few weeks. And then at every opportunity, I run. ran away. Yeah, mm -hmm. And just live my life. That's mm -hmm. what I did. Yeah, so you're always on the run, constantly looking over your shoulder. Yeah. So when you said you turned 19 and stuff, that's when shit really got out of hand. What kind of stuff were you involved in then? So then go out to Surrey, you know, like in M25. That's where all the stockbrokers live, the rich people. So then you would end up getting proper money for a change and it would do different things for you because you can buy big things what you couldn't have bought before. and also you come across firearms in it because that's the kind of people what get permits for firearms so mm. they have them in their houses yeah so the two joined together as i said because i was before i was a timid person when you put that with me it made the opposite effect 
and then it just made me become like just all all powerful because it's psychological now. Do you understand? Mm -hmm. It's not a physical situation, and I'm not really a physical person, so that's not going to work for me. But if it's a thing where we have an argument and it was a physical altercation, we'd be getting closer and closer to each other, then we're going to have to fight. But in that scenario, all I've got to do is move back one step. Do you understand? Mm -hmm. And then I can either place a shot in the air or in your leg or any which way I decide because it's not a contact scenario is an internal scenario you just got to be wicked enough to do that to someone mm -hmm. does that make sense yeah and that's what led to it so the night of shooting the two coppers were you already on the run yes for what for armed robbery and escaping from prison what a prison did you escape from Leicester and basically what happened was I was on remand for armed robbery of a post office and uh me and one of my colleagues weren't getting on and we were trying to get him to hold the case and he, weren't, he didn't want to hold the case and he told his solicitors behind our back. So there was an altercation in the prison, like a little mini riot, and they moved me to another prison and while that was going on, his solicitors got in contact to say that we can't be together because we're bullying him and we're that rubbish. So by the time I left the other jail, because obviously I'm just going to jails making problems, so they said they're not having me there and sent me back to, to Leicester. Leicester said, look, we're not putting you on the landing because the, the solicitors have said, you two can't be together. So we're going to take you to Brixton tomorrow morning, yeah? And that's your last chance until your trial. And if you don't behave, you're going to stay in the block until whenever your trial, yeah? So that's what he told me. This is the governor. But the man weren't thinking straight. Because what they did, they moved me from the other prison to this prison, straight into the block with all my stuff. And in the other prison, it had this kind of system where you can get your clothes bought in with a tag. So they put a tag around your clothes and some of the inmates had some of the tags stolen. So we were just putting them on the bags and putting what we wanted and sending it through. So I had a lock knife already, a real lock knife. So I put in a bag of sugar and it came with me to Leicester with all my stuff. So when he's telling me all this, I got the knife already in the sugar bag in my kit in the cell with me and then he's telling me I'm going tomorrow and I'm going to South London so that's where I live so nothing's stopping me from trying this now because obviously it, all the pieces have just come together yeah mm -hmm. so saying so we was driving and then the driver he didn't really know the way properly I swear down so when we got to London like I started saying to him, I know the way, this and that. And I, I was directing him, basically. <laughs> I swear. So, was he listening as well? Yeah. So I took him to Clapham South, South Circular, and then it just happened. I'm not proud of it or nothing, but basically I used, I used the knife, stuck up the officer, made him undo the uncuffs, and then I took all three of them out of the car and took the car and drove it off and escaped, made good my escape. And then I went and kitted out myself, did something else, got some money, went to Jamaica within six days. That's what happened. So, so now I'm in Jamaica and so we stepped up another gear and I'm just living my life like normal again. And then something happened in England, I had reason to come over here, came over here, was living normally until that thing happened with the police. So it wasn't intentional, I didn't plan it. I was just living my life to how I decided I was living it. Mm -hmm. And it was working at the time. And when something's working, you don't normally change it, do you? Because why are you going to change it? If you're making 10 grand pocket money a day, until it goes wrong, you're not going to change it. Yeah. That's just natural. You become nature. greedy, don't you? Yeah. So oh. you just believe like you're super special. Untouchable. Yeah. Until you get uh -huh. the FBI SWAT team yeah. on, on you. So you were on the run for basically not taking hostages but knife up to the coppers escaping mm -hmm. and then went to Jamaica mm -hmm. I'm surprised you came back right but because I had a false passport I thought I had you know mm -hmm. I'm basically they don't know who I am so I can fly yeah and one thing when you're making money nothing can't stop the money from being made does that make sense yeah yeah and along the way sometimes things just happen 
people do silly things, talk where they shouldn't talk, or someone knows something they shouldn't know and tries something they shouldn't try, and then they need to get disciplined, and this is just how it goes. It never ends. Mm. So that's what happened. Yeah. I came back to England, and within six weeks, that had happened with the police. So on the day of the shooting of the two coppers, what was the build up from that? So basically, you just going no, about your daily, your normal yeah, daily no, life. Yeah. Basically, uh, I had a guy with me who was at that time. He had a kind of name for himself in Brixton, and he was his name was 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 kind of was powerful. But there's levels in life to everything. Do you understand? So when you get to a certain level, some people their head might go or they're not up to it or whatever. Do you understand? That's like when you get a conventional army, you'll get a standard regional soldier, then you get a SAS soldier or different. They've got different capabilities and they've got different ranks for what they can do because they know there's levels. So this guy, he was a friend at the time before all of this happened and we used to hang around sometimes and do a bit of stuff together, whatever, meaning whatever. Anything goes, so it could be anything. And on this day, I sent another little young kid to Brixton to collect some money from someone who owed me. It was only like £1,200, and it wasn't an issue, but I told him to collect it and then give him something else but to collect the money. And he gave him something else, and he didn't collect the money, and it just pissed me off. But what I should have done is I should have sent him back to go and get rectify it. But me not being strict, I just said, so my friend come and jumped on the bike and just to go there myself. So we went to the pub and I saw my friend, but I saw the police car go like round the corner and I, saw, I knew he was turning round. So when I went in the pub, I did what I was doing and I said to my man, listen, we gotta go. And then when we went to the motorbike to leave, the bike, it's got like, we touched it or someone touched it and it's got like a timer on it. So then it stops the bike from riding for like 30 or 60 seconds that delay switch so that's what happened so we're stuck now standing there with the bike do you understand yeah when in ironically if that didn't happen we would have been gone because the police car didn't come around for at least a few more seconds mm -hmm. and this was a 600 cc motorbike we'd have been gone and then we would never have saw each other they was on overtime just looking overtime yeah so they're at the wrong place at the wrong time too mm -hmm. and they're just thinking this is just going to be a regular thing nothing out of the ordinary, you understand? Because they don't know who I am. So then that's that's it, they they came. And then my co-defendant's trying to be clever. He's saying he ain't got nothing to hide and, and showing them his pockets. So he's already trying to line me up in it because he knows my situation, you understand? So he's already, he's starting to do the rap thing already because if he says he ain't got nothing to hide, that means that I must have started to hide. <laughs> yeah, he's yeah. passed the buck. Yeah, yeah, you understand? So this thing's getting sticky. And then the next thing you know, uh, everything got close and personal and fast and it just all happened like quick, quick, quick. Because once he said that, then the first officer was like close to me you get me and then it just happened from there like all in like half a second and then I'm just thinking I need to escape because that was the whole reason why it started in the first mm -hmm. place I just didn't want to go back to prison I didn't want to go to prison that's the truth and you're willing to kill to well, stay at out? that moment I was well I don't I didn't go think as far as that I want to mm -hmm. kill I just thinking as far as I want to escape that's the truth because if I was thinking as far as to kill people then I'd not being nasty, I'll be shooting people in their head, not in their leg. You understand? Yeah, going yeah. on a killing spree kind right. of thing. Yeah. In leg, that means you're not trying to kill someone, you're trying to get away. And in this country, it's not like in Jamaica where you can shoot someone or say, get on the floor, this and that, and they're going to listen. England don't work like that. No English policeman ain't going to listen to you, if no matter what you tell him. Yeah? So it was a tight situation. In hindsight, I wish it never happened. Yeah? or all the other things I thought of what could happen, I could have shot the tire out, or all the different things to make it less than it was. But it just happened, mm -hmm. and that's what happened. So what was it like to shoot a man? It, I don't, I can't really 
at that time did you have no empathy no sympathy just, I just anger yeah not even anger it was just I was just doing what I what I viewed I needed to do yeah in the, the way that I just normally do things which was methodical and just like robot like and that's it do you understand did you so carry a gun every day every day and for protection under my pillow just generally for my protection and to have my own way and to make sure that I don't get caught in any situation where I can't come out on top that was why it was basically carried mm-hmm. and now everything's reversed I haven't got no gun I've just got a dog and a lot of CCTV camera and I live and move in a different way as to cut down all possibilities of stupidness happening do you understand Mm -hmm. because it can happen yeah now like it's ten a penny everybody wants to be bad even when they're not bad they'll be bad today and then cry tomorrow when they're in prison Mm-hmm. Do you understand? Yeah. So I know all of this, and now I've managed to side skirt it because it's just messy. Yeah. And to go through all that, like I say, all the trauma and pain in your life, and then to come to a stage in your life, you think I just don't want to go back to prison. That you're willing to do whatever it, you could do to, just to stay away. So what was the procedure after you done what you done? Did you? How long were you on right. the run for? So basically, I was on the run for not that long, about a year. Went to America. Well, went to Holland first, then to America. I was in South Bronx, then Connecticut. More gang thing, because I was with some Jamaicans, and they're in war with other Jamaicans. So it's the same kind of thing. Gun just different day, place. Just different place. And then that FBI team arrested us, found 20 kilo weed in the house, found a Mac 11 in my waist, a Glock in the kitchen, and like 20, like a key of coke. So it was a drug factory, the house. And the girls, what was with us, they came from England. And basically, they made their own little deals and then everybody went back. And then I went back last. And then I got like 67 years all together for all of the charges where I did get found guilty for in England. Yeah. So you get caught in America? Yeah, Connecticut. When did they extradite you back? I was in uh, Bridgeport Connection. Connect- Bridgeport Connect Correctional Centre for about maybe six months. How was that? It's not nice. Heavy there, isn't it? The, a, the guys are monsters. Yeah, mm-hmm. some big guys, and they, their gang thing is different. Kites flying around with messages on it. Who's your celly? He cool. This, that. You understand? Bag of different things. Politics, like you wouldn't believe. Yeah, it's a scary place. But because the Jamaicans were ours around, they was like some serious people and they had people in there on double murders and triple murders and all that. So I was around them, so I was kind of okay. But if you just went there and you weren't extremely violent and at least 18 stone, <laughs> yeah, yeah, you got problems. Mm-hmm. That's what I'm making, you know, yeah. Yeah, so you get caught in America? Yeah. Fuck's so, sake. Yeah, that was something else. Mm. Were you looking forward to getting back then? <laughs> no, I, I don't ever want to go back to America again. No, to get extradited, to get away from there? Well, yeah, because like, when I realised there weren't no way out of this because they put a bond on me, yeah? The million dollar bail bond weren't what was keeping me because I could pay 100000 and get out. But they took, they said I used the false passport, said I'm an Im- uh, Ill- illegal alien. Mm. And then they used the immigration sticker to hold me. Because otherwise, I could have just got bail again, even with all them charges. Even the ones back here? Yeah, that, yeah, yeah, was yeah, that irrelevant? Yeah, yeah. It's not relevant, but you can get bail. You understand? Yeah. But what they do, they make the bail high. So if they see your house is full of expensive stuff and your mm-hmm. jewellery and that, then they say, right, two million, three, they make it so they think you couldn't get it. But if you can pull the money up, you can get it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What were you thinking about then when you were coming? How did you get brought back home? Aeroplane? Yeah, it was weird. How many security? It was mad. And there was like the American uh, police and then they handcuffed me and had a blanket over me. And then there was this blonde girl with John Nillian glasses on and I was joking with her. She was joking with mm-hmm. me. 
and the man saying, I'm going to stop it because I'm scared. And I'm saying, what are you talking about? Can't you see the girl smiling? You understand? Yeah. But when we got to England and the gun police came under the aeroplane and started reading off all the different charges, mm -hmm. the atmosphere changed and everybody's heads was down and then people were just getting off. You get me? Is that when it hit home off. to yeah, you that yeah. they thought you're done? This is serious. Yeah. 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 And then they had uh, a Jeep and all these motorbikes and the van, the Cat A van on the tarmac ready to take me to South Norwood Police Station. Didn't stop for traffic lights, nothing. And then they was there trying to convince me to plead guilty. In hindsight, I should have, because it, it was overwhelmingly obvious anyway, yeah? But I just didn't. And that made me get 25 years when I could have got probably 18 years. Just not pleading guilty is just showing even more contempt for the whole scenario. Do you mm -hmm. understand? But even then, I still didn't realise or look at life in that way because I was still going through my processes and I was only 25. How old are oh, 25? That's madness to have went through all the shit that you've went through to be only 25. Mm -hmm. But then there comes a time you need to face the music. What ha What was it like the first night doing your 25? <sighs> my hair was dropping out and everything, bro. It wasn't nice. And then I just I just lost myself in drugs. That's what I did. Because I didn't even want to even deal with it. It was it was deep, bro. And I wouldn't really wish that on my worst night, on my worst enemy. Prison ain't no nice place. And no one ain't tougher than them bars. And when it comes down to it, it's a cold, sterile, unhealthy place. You understand? With unhealthy characters everywhere and you have to keep yourself sane in all of that for 20 years yeah it's a long time a very long time to give away your life but again it's all part of your process all the stuff that you're doing now which we'll touch on in a bit you have sometimes you need to go through all that misery and pain and darkness and hurt and hatred and tears and whatever the shit you go through drug abuse whatever but again, the beauty of life is, in your prime example, people can change. They That's can. a beauty, man. No one, no one could believe what has happened with me. Mm -hmm. No one. Yeah, it's phenomenal. That man there will tell you, no yeah. one. Yeah. yeah. They said, scheme is finished. That's what they said. How many different prisons were you in doing your 25? Just the high security estate. I was category A, double category A when I went in, and I got released as a single category A. Mm -hmm. without a station dog taking me to the gate. So that means they didn't expect me to last outside. That means there was no, and there's no love there at all. Cause if yeah. normally you get released as a D cat, mm -hmm. I'm getting released as a cat A and then be put straight on surveillance. So if my life didn't turn around like this, my life wasn't going to be nice. Mm -hmm. That's what I can tell you for sure. Were you on drugs from day one in there then just to escape the pain? Practically, yeah. When did you start getting yourself clean? Like halfway through. So what was the moment you realised, OK, I need to get my shit together? When, after you do about 10, then you kind of see the road a little bit. Yeah. But you just got visions of what you think it's going to be. You don't mean it's really going to be that. But it's still a vision. And that's all you need in it. It's just hope and belief. And yeah, faith and hope's a yeah. powerful thing. Were you doing any reading or anything when you were in? I used to read sometimes, but mostly what I do is watch Newsnight, Jeremy Paxson, mm -hmm. and all that kind of stuff. I liked all that stuff. Yeah. And politics. Yeah. So I'd watch them for my own reasons and make my own decisions about what's really going on and, and glean knowledge from it for my own ends. So that's what I used to do. When did you start adapting to the system? A year, a week, a month, you never adapt or? I didn't. Never? That's the truth. Mm -hmm. And if I wasn't, if I was doing life, I would never have got out. I'll be in there right now. I'll be a bitter old man right now in there. You understand? Mm -hmm. Yeah. What about the, the people you came across? Did they die in prison? Did they? I've met loads of people who've died in prison. Some have hanged themselves. Some have done it because they just couldn't do no more bird. Others, one did it because he was a nonce. Sorry to use the word, but that's, that's fine. my yeah, yeah. Uh, opinion of him. Yeah. And he uh, did, because everyone was telling him he needs to redeem himself a little bit. 
and he seemed to believe or be of the belief that because uh, years ago there used to be raping and pillaging it's okay for him to do it in uh, the 70s or whenever it was he done it and he's just sitting in prison yeah that doing what I don't know so everyone got on to him and eventually he did it so that one there that's the only one what I can't really say nothing apart from he redeemed himself a mm -hmm. little bit but when it's some people what you care about or what you think like one old man yeah he could have gone home long time and he he couldn't hurt no one and they said no you could still hurt some old people in the old people's home yeah because you could still move your hands and all that and then when he had about four five days left to live they took him to the health care and then let him die over there on his own it's mm. nasty and then one of the officers i said to her what happened to ted and this is uh he's dead and she started laughing and i said you know you're wicked he said can't you take a joke and i said but what part of it's funny i don't yeah. understand if you get me <laughs> so prison is not a nice place and you have to be strong because if you ain't strong enough to survive you have to either go to a mental hospital or you have to go in a body bag they're not just gonna you can't just say i've done enough porridge now i've had enough can i go home i've seen men think that they can go home this guy, he had his missus, he loved her, and he wanted to get married to her, and she was very beautiful. And one visit, he just got up with her and started walking to the gate. <laughs> I swear <laughs> to God. <laughs> I swear down. And the officer said, where are you guys, Steve? And he said, I'm going home. He lost it, mm -hmm. and that was it, he was gone. Yeah. The man was gone. He went straight from there to the healthcare mental breakdown losing just his like mind that. lost his mind yeah you would be you getting stuck in a cage for yeah, right. so this long what, man. this is what can happen yeah so it's not a joke so once you started getting your release date and stuff when did you start working on yourself were you thinking I'm going to come out here and go back to my to, old ways or are you going yeah, to really make to changes honest, no to be honest the first time I came out 2011 I came out to a bit of money and everybody else was a bit scared so they was giving me money and I just went to a lot of lap clubs. Before you knew it, I got nicked again. For what? For conspiracy to rob. I didn't even last nine months. That's the truth. But you out on license? Yeah. <laughs> Fuck. <laughs> How long did you have crazy. left? I know, I had, because if I had stuck to that first license, yeah. it would have been just two years. But because it got broken, it added it to six years. So now I've gone back to jail mm -hmm. on a conspiracy to rob charge, persons unknown, that's when it's getting sticky, because that's when- They it can, can make up shit to get right. you. Right. Yeah. So then, yeah, I'm telling you now, I don't know if you're religious, but I'm, I, I, I definitely believe in God, yeah? And if I never talked to God that, that day, no one never talked to God before, yeah? I told him the truth, I said, I'm done. I said, I'm done, I'm done. Nothing named crime am I involved in. You see it? I just need to come out of it. Because I knew if I got life sentence, I couldn't manage that bird there. Because I've just done 17 years and three months. Yeah? So if you're gonna tell me about L plate again now, that's the end. I done made up my mind that I'm gonna string up and everything. Seriously. They knew <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> they knew. <laughs> I'll tell you the truth. Yeah, it was serious. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And God was on my side. And I got my not guilty and my life's never been looked back since mm -hmm. because even before when it was rocky, I still wouldn't cross that that promise. Do you understand? Yeah. Because you can't trick God, you know. It's He's not, watching everywhere. Right. Well somebody's watching. Well, right there you go. So that's the order. Mm -hmm. Do you understand? So Yeah. Yeah, yeah really, I got a lot of people powerful. on the show who's had fucked up pasts and spent a lot of time in prison, twenty, thirty years and they maybe turn to Christ or God or a belief. If you're not harming anybody and your life is going good, I don't care who you believe in. We've all seen the world differently. We've all got different perceptions of who we believe in and what and, we do. And, and what I can testify to is this. Since writing that book, the outcome of the book is the newspaper articles in The Guardian and The Times and all that, that led to gun number six, what won a BAFTA. Yeah. All of these things just keep spiraling and coming from the same thing. The peace and new friendship with the policeman, what 
the same hand what mm. I used to shot him, I'm shaking his hand with. Do you understand? Yeah. That's the same book. Mm-hmm. The book's powerful. And then now James has wrote his part to put on this part. So like, so it's both sides of the story mm-hmm. in the book. And then we've got a Netflix series in the pipeline, mm-hmm. which is gonna be no more than 18 months away. It's yeah, like that's a mini, beautiful. A yeah, series. Gun Number Six was phenomenal. By the way, mm. I know Daryl Laycock. He's a good friend of mine. Yeah, Daz, yeah, a man, a great guy. guy. Yeah, Not yeah. case. Yeah, 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 um, yeah, yeah. But great again for all the shit yeah. that he's been through and trying to make changes yeah. and trying to help yeah. the young kids. Yeah. But that's a phenomenal watch. Gun yeah. Number Six. Yeah, phenomenal yeah, watch. Yeah. So yeah. when you wrote the book, when did you start writing this? 2016. Just before you get out. Uh, no, just after. So Cause just I, after I, you I got get out. The second time, mm-hmm. 2014. So I laid down for a year and then my partner was on to me, what are you gonna do? The only people, what, she said, the only people I know what you get money is from a will or when you go to work. And she said that I can't have you around me and when people ask, what do you do? You ain't got no answer for them. Do you understand? Yeah. Just common things. Yeah. And then now that I'm an author and an actor and a mentor mm-hmm. and all these stuff, it's so nice because I can be my, who I am. Yeah, yeah. And it's a I nice can see feeling. you smiling there. Yeah. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? And it's then when I'm around some gangsters, yeah, and then the people ask what are you doing or who are you or what do you do? And mm-hmm. I'm, I'm, it's amusing to watch them stumble and just come out with some nonsense that <laughs> if, <laughs> if yeah. they ask them one more question, mm-hmm. their whole thing flops because yeah. it's a lie. Mm-hmm. Do you understand? So I yeah. bet you never thought you would have those things in your resume. No. But again, I always say it, that is the beauty of life. It's it is. an amazing thing. It's a fucking roller coaster. It's a painful, painful journey. But you are, and you see all the motivational speakers talking about it, you are the director of your own film. You hold the pen to write your own life. The it's next not chapter. A joke. Yeah. No one can stop you. Yeah, of course, because man. Now, Belie- like you say, belief, hope, faith. You've got to have them. You must believe in yourself to create whatever you want to create. Now, whatever you think you will create and manifest. So why not create something special? You see, you see what I want to say as well to any young person, yeah? Don't think you have to do some caveman stupid stuff like just be around negative people on a block or this or that to just get £50 and £100 and some little stupid money to save up and think you're in any game about anything because you're not. And you can just use your brain, open up your mind a bit, go on the internet and look a little idea and try it. Sometimes you it could you could try an idea on the internet for a hundred pounds sometimes if you pick the right things. Use your brain, open up your mind, go different places. If you come from an estate, smarten up yourself at least once a week or so and go somewhere like a museum or somewhere different. Meet new people. Just try, yeah, not to just be a sheep and follow bad influences because you're going to click off your time and time is everything. Mm -hmm. Do you understand? Yeah, it's the most precious thing in this world is your time, man. You can't never, no matter how much money you make, you can never buy time back. It's never going to come back. So when you wrote the book and then the copper James reached out to you, how were you feeling then? Were you thinking, is this a setup? Were you thinking? I was scared. Yeah? Yeah, I was. I was scared. But I said to myself, boy, at the end of the day, I'm going to have to go. And I I, I don't think he can really do me something in a train station. Mm -hmm. That would have to be really blazing. So I just picked the train station. And then after, when we start communicating and emails and this and that, I realised he's been through a lot of stuff too. Because he's not just my thing, someone else shot after him. And he's like, for the armed robbery and saved a baby and had to clean up a a dead person or a train track, enough different stuff has happened to him in his own life. Seems a nice man as well. No, he is a nice man, but nothing's happened to him and it's in the book. So when you're reading the next one, you'll see what I'm talking about. So he is a definition of a hero, if you want to put it that way, because he really woke up and done that for the public. You understand? Mm -hmm. When I was doing my thing, it was for me. So I'm not no kind of hero. I'm just a guy What? was on the wrong side of the tracks and just did whatever I thought was right for me at the time. A hero is someone who's got civic duty and, you know, core values for everyone and yeah. humanity and will just do things for the sake of doing mm-hmm. it because it's right rather than 
for soft reasons, you understand? Yeah. In a life of crime, you know yourself, you become a selfish, selfish bastard. Yeah, every, nobody matters but yourself. Yeah. And as much as the old bull, you grow up to t be told to hate them and snitches get put in ditches and fucking... It's ironic. Yeah. And now I, I swear to you straight, I ain't got no reason to hate them. Because the yeah. first thing is, I don't crime. So me and them ain't got no negative contact. <laughs> you understand? Because yeah. they ain't got no reason to bother with me because mm -hmm. I don't do nothing. And then the one where I did do something to has forgive me. So who have I got to complain to or anything about? I ain't got nothing to complain Yeah, that's about. a strong man to forgive yeah. that somebody that shot you. other police are not happy with him about that. Mm -hmm. But he still did it because he knew in his heart that was what he wanted to do. Did he get PTSD or anything from it? Yeah. yeah so the trauma and the pain would have been. Does he have kids himself? Yeah. So, but again, it's, he would have, that's a bit of closure for him. For you two to be friends after shooting a man, a police officer is unbelievable. Is is. Number, that is some film material. That, that's, that's why some it's going to be level shit. Yeah. Because it literally is that. Mm -hmm. And it's a story of redemption. And it's a very powerful story. Yeah, good and on that, man, to true. James. Man, nah, fair yeah, play. James, James is different. Respect, yeah. He is, he's different. Because you were standing on the roof in Scotland Yard. Basically, what happened was, when the... Uh, interview came out on telly on the BBC we've got lots of different radio stations and different interviews off of the back of it yeah and then he then he contacted me and said that the mayor the uh, commissioner wants to see me and him yeah but he didn't say nothing again about it but he did tell me the date and you know like police and army people they just talk once so I should have known that's the date so when the date actually came I wasn't even ready or nothing I was indoors yeah and he, and, he, and he phoned five minutes before and said, are you, are you here? I said, what are you on about? And this is him, the, the meeting with the commissioner. And I'm like, what? I said, listen, I'm coming, I'm coming. And I just put on a suit, yeah, and I just raced across to the embankment, yeah. And like, I was like 30 minutes late to my embarrassment, but they was there, sitting down, talking, and then went up all these stairs, went into the room, and then the lady was just sitting there and we just spoke about politics, life, and how I turned it round and core values and stuff. And yeah, it was, it was an experience. How does that make you feel? Yeah, it's powerful. Yeah. To think where you're coming from mm -hmm. and to be received like that, that person is in charge of 50,000 police officers. That's that, to, that explains everything. And then to go on the roof is a like, place of power in it because you've got the London Iron and the River Thames and all that city underneath mm -hmm. it so it's just got that power kind of feel into it and it's something what I wouldn't forget How does people from the life of crime treat you that you've come out changed your life now you're meeting police how do they see you now? A lot of people who the sensible people understand and get it yeah because say like if I got a job uh, doing talks in a police training centre where they train police to be police yeah that's actually helping everybody because then hopefully them police won't be so eager to just trail and search black people because they'd have a different perception do you understand so anyone with IQ on that kind of level would understand that it's positive yeah and then the real underprivileged people who are unenlightened and everything else you can't please them no matter what you do. So you've got to kind of put them on the, on the, on the burner because they're really irrelevant anyway because they're the minority. And to me, what matters is young kids, young meaning from 10 up, when they can start making impressions of themselves or deciding things and people can shape their minds, yeah? People who are already messed up, yeah? It's for them to unmess themselves, you get me? So what they think of me is not really going to be relevant, but no one ain't come to me and said anything negative. Do you understand? Most people say positive things or they don't say nothing. Yeah. yeah. No matter what you do in life, people are always going to judge you one anyway. One thing I can say, I've never made a statement on anybody in my whole life, mm -hmm. yeah? And I don't, I don't know how I ever would or could because it's just not in my DNA. So I've never done it, yeah, because of how I used to live. And it's just been in me for so many years that it's unlikely that it would ever go away. And I can know that that's just how it is. So I hope that I never get in a situation 
where I have to ever do anything but just say no problem it's cool do you understand mm -hmm. and I hope nothing ever bad happens where I have to be in a situation to cross any kind of roads because I like the position where I'm in where I can communicate with everybody equally and not uh compromise anybody mm -hmm. does that make sense yeah yeah did you ever go through any psychologists or anything or anything where they talk about the well, shit that you went through as a kid no I didn't because uh, I've seen people in prison go to them people and end up in Broadmoor and all them kind of things end up against you and if I was going to do that myself I'd have to pay for it privately and mm -hmm. then I might have faith in it so I've managed to just evolve I don't know that's the most I can say yeah. and draw strength from good people around me and enlighten myself along the way and it's working so that's the most I can say but I haven't had no professional intervention mm -hmm. per se yeah but listen if you're on a good path and you're doing good things mm -hmm. and it's working yeah it's working so just stay to it's true to you and stay in the path so moving forward for the future What's, um, where do you see yourself? Well, now, once we get the uh, Netflix out of the way, that will be the big thing. And then after that, that's life changing scenario. And then I'll probably do something with some football uh, club or some other organization and just put something together where we can just help some young people with startups or something constructive what can actually help them and then that's my bit towards what I help to create in a little way because we all put our little part towards it because mm -hmm. before when there wasn't a lot of gunmen about and I was one of them I'm adding to the scenario to make more and more gunmen come in the future does that make sense? Yeah. So that's the least I can do that I've come full circle and I'm in a position where I can help myself then I'm more than happy to help others and like we done something with Tesco's not too long ago we done a food bank and managed to give like 30 single mothers like food for a week and then 20 homeless guys so those kind of stuff I like doing and things what can individually help people like I've got like one lady, her son, he's good at football, but she couldn't afford taking the training centers because she ain't got a car. And then we got her like a little 1,000 pound run around and like she just made up because now the bigger picture can continue mm -hmm. and he can train. And I said to him, listen, brother, train until your lungs burst. Don't take this for no joke because you, you got talent there, yeah? And God's blessed you with that and make sure that you put it to good use so that you can help your mum and yourself and he gets it you understand mm -hmm. so now if he turns into a pro I feel nice in my heart because yeah. I know that I helped to facilitate it mm -hmm. to a reality those are my kind of things yeah the yeah. stuff that's good for the soul yeah. all the external shit don't mean fuck all it's that's good right. to have money it's good to have nice stuff but if you're feeding your soul with helping others that's right. the gift in it's life rich. I believe yeah. it's just you can't buy that shit no, no matter really where nice. you're sitting in the world the, the, the stuff to help others and yeah. mate, it's a win-win for everybody you're helping someone they appreciate it yeah. but there's something within you it just makes you and it is nice. really feel good man yeah, it is. are you going to be doing something with James in the future? Mm -hmm. so he's going to put his part we're going to republish the book it's going to get reissued mm -hmm. we've got an agent on top of it and we're gonna get some famous guys to come as well, like hopefully Tyson Fury and some other people and some influencers, so it'll be a proper book launch. And then that story there, because James now will be a part of the story, it will have the traction to go onto all the different daytime chat shows and all of that and get the recognition what it's deserving. And then the Netflix will kick in after. Mm -hmm. And then that's it. And at best, uh, an audio book with a local rapper from South London and then that's the full package making moves brother yeah, yeah fair play to you yeah. I look forward to seeing your journey for anybody watching this maybe yeah. in the gang life maybe just out of prison maybe in prison and listening to this but 
What advice would you give for them? For a man who's lived that, spent over 20 years right. in prison, what would if you say? If you're coming out of prison, yeah, that's the stiffest part. Make sure that you just go around some tight people who are real, who's going to keep you on grounded on a long haul, not like no quick fix. Don't be in a rush. You lived in there on 10 and 15 pound a week. Don't watch all them Bentleys and Mercedes flying around and let it twist your head because someone could be working for that for 10 years and you don't know about how they got it. Do you understand? So just watch your own journey and put something practical together. Get a driving license, get a stable income, even if it's small, and then just build on it in any constructive way that you can. That's, that's what you need to do because it's basically that serious and the chances are going to get less and less as time passes. If you're in your 30s and you're robust and you're about something, there's going to be work out here for you because the government needs people who are robust and ready to get in in the middle of things with young people, basically 15-year-olds and whatever, what want to be waving around knives and that. If you're a person who's willing to get in the middle of all of that and, you understand, yeah. break things down to kids, there'll be work there for you. You get me? Mm -hmm. Schools, colleges, there's loads of different ways, yeah? And the internet is open for everybody. If you can speak a second language, be a, uh, uh, what's the word? Translator, yeah? That's a straight job. You can get money, give your cards out to all the different solicitors, you'll get money straight away. Think out the box. Think out the box and make it be relevant to your own life and something will work for you. If you're a little you and you're in a block, you're living a block, hide, just stay in your house, stay in your bedroom, use your computer, really, yeah? And try and find the most opposite friends what you can from what is standing out on your street corner, remember? And if a man's telling you, oh, you're moist, you're this or that, just say to him, fine, or oh, I don't know what you mean by that, or walk him out, run, tell him, allow me, please, I'm scared. Tell him anything, just get away from him. You understand? Because at the end of the day, that little bit of embarrassment or what you might feel is you're not being manly is nothing compared to if you get into something with him and then end up stabbing him by accident or vice versa and either you're dead or he's dead and it's just a waste from both sides over nothing and if you link constructive people constructive things will come your way the internet is actually a part of your life you're born with it so it's definitely going to be a part of the future and you need to factor that into whatever you're going to do for your own self in your life that's the best I yeah. can say what about your social media where can people contact you right so we've got out of the box book uk that's the main website it's got all of the content on there and then on there it's got all the individual links the instagram youtube uh twitter and facebook facebook yeah so you can touch any one of them links and it will come up and then definitely follow the instagram out of the box uh book or out of the box slash book and it's a red logo you won't miss it and yeah follow the journey because it's going to be a good one yeah perfect love it mate Leroy for coming on today brother and telling it's your story I appreciate that yeah. stay blessed mate okay. keep doing what you're doing yeah. look forward to seeing your journey Check out more of my podcasts on the right and be sure to like, share and comment your thoughts on this week's podcast. Thank you.